Hello, everyone, and welcome to the future of space. I'm your host, Daniel Fox. Our guest today is Jim Kitchen. He's a University of North Carolina Chapel Hill business professor and entrepreneur. Jim was a crew member on Blue Origins space flight of March 31st, and he is a world explorer. Jim, welcome to the future of space. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And hello, everyone. Jim, you just went to space. You have a long history of looking up to the stars. But before we get into that, could you share with us three words that capture the essence of space for you? I think the first one uh, would be humbling. Um, you know, looking, there's been billions of people that have looked up from Earth to space and to actually be able to go and do that um, was so humbling, uh, especially as a, as a professor, as a teacher, uh, a lifelong explorer. Um, so word number one would be humbling. Word number two would be void, um, void of oxygen, void of a lot of resources, void of of humanity, which makes the earth that much more spectacular. Um, and my third word would be uh, critical. Um, we've, we've got to get off this planet and do much more because the growth curve of uh, the human growth curve, 100, 200, 500 years from now, it's just not sustainable. If we're at 8 billion people now, uh, I don't know that this planet can withstand 16 billion people. So it's critical. Uh, space is, is critical for all of those things. And some of which I think we'll probably talk about uh, today. Isn't it what we've been doing really the human species ever since you know, we started the, as a tribe first, but to always go beyond these places where we started, we, 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 we are born with a certain circumstances and geographical, you know, location. But then at one point we outgrow those places. And I think that's, that's how nature works. Like every species had like outgrows his environment. Like, you, you know, we can think of even just a pack of wolf at one point, one couple alpha couple is going to have to find new pasture because now it's too many people in one place it's just that now i think it's harder for people to understand this principle because we've reached at the planetary scale now we have to we have to really kind of push the boundary yep. to go and, and and establish ourselves into space but that's one thing that we've been doing ever since the beginning would you agree you're so right um i i i mean let me change the tenor of this conversation i blame my my putting, my bad putting, my three, uh, my three putts when I golf on, uh, you know, the concept that the world, the earth was flat uh, and we were afraid that it was. So I never hit the ball past the hole. I had this, this, this fear of, you know, of going beyond. And I think that humanity um, lived like that for a while. And then we're like, oh, well, maybe it's not flat. Let's go explore. And we've just been exploring and exploring. I just think it's it's part of who we are um, to, to explore and see beyond and what more is there. It, it, it feels, you know, personally, it feels, people always ask me, why do you travel like you do? Um, space, are you kidding me? And for me, it just, it fills my soul. It's, it's who I am. It, it helps me understand more of me. And I think, you know, my ancestors and yours and many of those viewers watching, you know, have for generations wanted to know more and more. It's just it, it's a quest for knowledge because it gives us context of who we are today. Now, you came out of Blue Origin with the flag 194 and understand that that's your 194 country or destination. So obviously you, Boundary. <laughs> you've been traveling. Boundary there. They're all in the back. Um, You've been traveling yeah. for a very long time. Was that 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 um, curiosity of new experiences always with you, even even when you were a teenager, or was there a specific moment when you you really yeah. started to to travel? Oh no, 
No, it, it, it came. So my mom and dad were public school teachers and they were, um, I grew up in South Florida and every, you know, we didn't have a lot, but we had, uh, my parents said the three best things about teaching were June, July, and August. And we had a wood paneled station wagon and they'd put the kids in the back. Um, uh, and I had the way back. I had the, the rear facing seat out that wagon. My parents were, you know, we didn't have enough money to have the air conditioner on. So I'm looking this way. Mom and dad are driving there. And my sisters are in the, the middle seat they occupied. And I was in the way back where the luggage was underneath me. And so I saw the continental United States facing backwards and the, with the windshield down and the exhaust coming in. So that explains some of my, you know, travel uh, neuroses of, you know, wanting to see the world and doing crazy fun things. But I saw the United States continental U.S. backwards. Uh, you know, all of the 48 states. Um, so I had a unique perspective from the very beginning. Um, and I definitely inherited that wanderlust from my parents and it continued. I went to college and started uh, to no one surprise a, a travel business and began traveling and doing some other selling space travel and doing some other fun things. And, you know, so yes, I grew up, uh, I was an American field service exchange student in my uh, junior year. That was my first big international trip, uh, living in Valparaiso, Chile, um, kind of a port industrial town in, in, in Chile. Uh, and it was a fantastic experience. So I had this sort of formative experiences of, of travel and exploring and, and wanting to see more because it just was who I am. It, it, um, it was every part of me. And I just took that into my adulthood. So two questions from, from that one, do you think that the, it's something that we're losing today with our children because when we do travel, I mean, I remember also traveling with my parents and looking at the landscapes passing by and looking at the difference of houses and, and horizons and different structures. But now you look at the way that people travel in their cars and either they're on an iPad or they're looking at the computer that's in the back, you know, in the back seat. So they're kind of almost disconnected with the landscape in which they travel. So one question is, do you think that we're losing that? And the other question is, how important is traveling in shaping the character and, de and developing empathy and perspective and these crucial skills in understanding the world that we live in? So yes, but I'm a glass three quarters full person. So as a lifelong entrepreneur, I have said yes and, you know, let me see the best. Um, so yes, but hey, even if your kid has an iPad and, uh, you know, give them the right apps uh, so that uh, maybe when you're traveling, you know, it's, it's hard to be, it's hard to travel having kids and having taken kids all around the world uh, with me um, and to keep kids, you know, children engaged. So take the iPad, but then take it away from them and be like, hey, look out the window, check that out, you know, check that out much of the world is, is rural, right? When you drive through and it's like the same cow and the same field. And then, but like, okay, you can, so you can do both. I'm finding, I'm finding a way to, um, in this, you know, conversation to say yes, but take your kids as much as you can, because it, into the second question, it does, it makes your world bigger. It helps you. It will help them figure themselves out even subtly as their, as their children and to know their place in the world. Um, and to travel meaningfully, if you can, you know, be thoughtful of where you go and, and what you do and what you experience, even in, you know, the Cayman Islands or really glitzy resorts, uh, resort locations, you can do some really meaningful things, which will te teach life lessons to kids that they can, that they can absorb uh, and become better citizens, global citizens. Um, to, your, to your second point, so many things to, to learn um, while, while traveling. I have just finished a, a book about that. Um, I'm searching for the right publisher right, right now to, to go through those things. Uh, it's been a 30 plus year journey for me. Uh, you're so right about those, those lessons. Um, it, it has helped me as a, as a man to just evolve from a, for me, from a young man, one of my first trips, um, you know, after going to Chile was going to Nicaragua and, and seeing 
a, um, you know, living in a, um, just this rural, small rural village um, in a, a, a grass hut uh, with a thatched roof, uh, maybe 60, 70 square feet. Uh, none of the children had uh, shoes, you know, in the, in the entire neighborhood. Uh, and I stayed in the one hammock, uh, no indoor plumbing, outdoor, plum you know, just nothing. It was a very poor village. And I thought, I left that thinking, hmm, wow, I'm so fortunate. 30 years later, I saw the same scene in Tanzania. And instead of feeling sort of pity and how fortunate I was, I actually felt a little bit of envy because I saw these thatch huts. I saw the moms and dads interacting with their children. I, I saw the kids with the, the wheel that you see them running. You know, every every rural village seems to have kids running, running through it with a, a wheel. Um, and they had it all. They had food, clothing, shelter, community, laughter. Um, maybe they didn't have, you know, world class health care or child care or, you know, whatever, but they had it all. So instead, it, instead of feeling pity, I felt um, a bit of envy of it was a beautiful, simple life. So that evolution is such a great evolution. Um, and there's a zillion other things that you can learn from travel. And the word, the term that I use is, is travel makes your world bigger. We talk a lot about the internet and life and transportation and Lear jets and, you know, supersonic vehicles and, you know, space planes. And we can go from point A to point B in an hour. That makes your world really small, but travel makes your world bigger. I absolutely agree. I mean, the, you know, just back in the, th that time that we went to the moon, one of the biggest lessons that came out of that is that we went to the moon to learn about the moon, but we ended up actually learning, looking back at the earth and learning more about ourselves. And traveling mm -hmm. does that. You go first to seek these new places, these new experiences. But what you end up doing is learning how, what you have back home, grateful for those things, but learning about you and learning about these different perspectives and how people are connected to their, 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 their environment, their place. I mean, I remember uh, back in 2019 when I did my book tour, we crossed, we wanted to do it on the road trip. So we crossed the, the North America twice and you're driving and you see all those different landscapes and you see, you start to understand the culture, the difference of culture in people, how obviously Los Angeles or New York, where everything is so in your face. And then you get into the middle of the country and you drive for miles and miles and you just get, you know, little cabins there and there. And you, you understand that when people even just want to go and do the groceries, they have to travel for like half an hour. And that shapes the character. So traveling really kind of opens you up to all these different experiences and makes you understand this complexity of language, of communication and character. And it kind of, like you'd say, it opens up and broadens your, your, your understanding of the world. Yeah, I learned. I, I love that story that you just told <clears throat> so beautifully, um, <clears throat> so beautifully told um, because it's so heartfelt of, you know, you had you had time to to see to see that and to do it and saw, you know, drove back and forth. Um, and I think so many of us were in a rush to to see the world. Um, you know, there's been people that have traveled the world in, you know, like a year. Um, I heard of one person saw 30 countries in, in Europe in a day. And the thing that you miss with that, and that's not, you know, I, I saw all 193 UN recognized countries, but it took me 30 years and I had my, my children and my wife in tow. Um, so I didn't do it as a 23 year old, you know, single person just like racing through. I, I wanted to experience it because I do think. And that's not to say that, you know, if you're if you set a Guinness book for traveling the record for for traveling the world, you know, good good for you. You know, at least you tried and, and saw it. So you know, hats off to you on that. But for me, travel was something deeply personal. In fact, when I went to Syria in 2019, just before COVID hit, 
um, that was my 193rd country. And I, I was sad, like, I was sad um, because that traveling that UN recognized country list was just a way for me to see the world. It was a, it was a, it was a sort of a conduit after I got into 90, five countries or so. I was like, how many countries are there? I think I asked Jeeves. I, Google wasn't around at the time. It's like, Jeeves, how many, how many countries are there? Oh, there was 193. Um, that was so long ago. People, you know, people that are watching this or that are, you know, under 20 are like, what? What's he talking about? But um, it was a really bad web browser. Um, and so you would ask a question and Jeeves would read, he was the butler and he would retrieve your answer for you and give it to you. So um I just made a list of the places that I had been to and the places that I hadn't. Uh, and I just started this, this journey. I never intended to set out and see the world, but what I learned was uh, so many of those life lessons, like you just articulated and it just tr changed me as a person. And that's the essence of my, of this book. Um, you referenced yours and you know, mine was putting that, putting those life lessons together. Cause I'm a teacher. Um, another thing that I inherited from my, my parents, I've been a lifelong entrepreneur, but started teaching at uh, Keenan Flagler Business School at UNC in uh, 2010. And so my, my goal was to teach students life lessons uh, as told through the context of travel and then now space. Um, and some of those important lessons were connecting with others, finding common ground like that. So that would be one bucket, like learn how to young person, old person, you know, old dog, learn this new trick of learning to find common ground with people because we live in a very you know, divisive world. And if you seek conflict, you will find it. But if you seek to find common ground, uh, that's an invaluable lesson. And so when you're in Africa and you very quickly, you know, want to connect with somebody in the marketplace because you want to learn what is a bajia? Uh, I'm in Mozambique and I want to speak to Margarita who's making these things um, and all the kids are in line for it. What is that that she's making? And you have to bother Margarita and say, hey, would you show me what you're doing? She's going to look at you. She's going to size you up very quickly. If it's in your heart to connect, to, to have common ground, if you have a smile on your face, she's going to go, okay, I'll show you what I'm doing. Stranger, you know, Mzungu, uh, you know, white, white stranger. Um, and you know, so you, you gotta, gotta learn that, that you're and, and the second part of that is your place in the world. Like I'm no better than Margarita. I am, we're all uniquely human. I love what she's doing. I embrace what she's doing. Um, I'm genuinely interested in what she's doing. And so I'm, I'm looking this way because I'm imagining, uh, Margarita to be there. And so I want to under, understand what these bajias are. You know, they're they're basically fried dough, and why that's important, why margarita is important, is because there's a long line of children there, and that's the only thing that they will eat. Much of that country lives on less than a dollar a day until dinner, if they get dinner. So she's providing this low context, or low um, low cost, high carbohydrate diet for these kids uh, not to go hungry. And so I want to learn all about that. So by connecting with people and knowing your place in the world that you're a small part in this very large and complex and complicated world. Um, and I think the, the other, you know, the last thing, um, life lesson is, so you're in Mozambique or India or other places and you're like, wow, I was in Iraq at an, in an, um, an IDP camp and displaced person camp, 100,000 people there. And my guide said, hey, do you want to buy a turkey or a uh, turkey dinner for, for 10 people? And I, you know, I looked around, I'm like, what, you know, like what 10, right? And wanting to solve that problem, but um, instead taking that context, like taking that, that urge to serve back into my hometown of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and, 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 and using that context, that servant heart in my own home, first of all, so being the kind of husband and father that I need to be, you know, uh, an alert, engaged husband, an alert and engaged father. Uh, so my goal was to, when my kids said, hey, dad, play Monopoly, or hey, dad, jump in the pool. Hello, dad's watching. You know, yeah, say yes, not like, hey, later, right? Um, so taking that mindset and then 
doing stuff in your own community, giving to your own community. So if, if you travel and you don't see these things and pick them up and it doesn't change your world, then you've traveled just for not, um, you know, for, for, for the sake of traveling. For me, I wanted to not be a passport collector, but I wanted to, you know, like a, a stamp collector, um, but I wanted to be a connector. That was my goal, not to collect countries. Instagram, me, selfie, look at me. Morocco, hey, Morocco. No, I wanted to find the heart of Morocco. Um, and so that's how I did it in, in marketplaces with those three lessons um, always at the forefront. So I did, I mean, I still do a little bit, but I, I've done solo wilderness expeditions for 12, 13 years. And part of my, my process of going to these remote places was first to connect with the people because I've always found that it would be arrogant of me to come in and think that I can capture the spirit of this place by bringing with me the, my expectations. And what I would do is, first of all, sit at the table sharing a, a meal with people who live there and then hearing their stories and, and, and in it, discovering the place through their eyes, through their stories. And then the other thing that it, that it would do is that you start to realize that independently of how we go from there, we all start from the same place. We all start, everybody around the world, we all try to provide for our children. We all try to be recognized. We yeah. want to find value. We want to have a meaning in life and we want to be loved. And then after that, it gets a little bit complicated, but we all start from the same place. And when you sit at the table and you share food, that is really where the, you know, the, the magic happens. You're, talk, you're talking about, there are two things that was going through my mind when you're talking about traveling. So in Europe, the, the, the gap year is seen as an asset when you go travel. Like often employers will ask you, why is it that you did not travel? Because they see travel as a, as a really strong asset in business because now you, you, you understand the world in a different way. In the U.S., we often see it's like, why waste a year of travel when you can, you know, really put it into an internship or go straight to the business? But I like I I wish people saw the value in traveling. And then I remember this. Uh, it was back in the days of uh, iPhone, BlackBerry, and there was this travel magazine who had done a uh, a little competition, a little test. They sent three people out with a series of tasks to do traveling one had an iphone one had a, a blackberry and then the other one had no iphone and no blackberry and the person who ended up winning was the person with no iphone no blackberry but not only did he win but he also discovered even more because not having the iphone or the blackberry forced him to ask around and to read really to interact with the people and then the people would be like you're asking about this but there's something else, or you should come to see us all that and just increasing and enhancing the experience. And while I, I mean, listen, I love my technology and we love the, I love my iPhone and all the, 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 the benefits that it gives us, but also learning to kind of put it aside and connect and interact with the people because they're just a gateway to so much experiences and, and this human story that bonds us all. Like I, you know, you visited 190, well, 94 uh, uh, boundaries now. Like it's, the stories that you have are absolutely amazing. Like your children must be so grateful for all the experiences that you've brought to them. Yeah, no, I, I love I love hearing that. Um, and yeah, you know, it's um, I I love what you said about. I have a freshman at a uh, first year student at UNC and she's stressing a little bit about what she's going to do in the summer. And, you know, should I get an internship? Should I come home? And, uh, you know, it just reminds me that travel, there's no substitute for travel. What, what I'm, what we're very seriously considering is to, you know, have her maybe find a friend or two and just backpack through Europe. We seem to have lost that. That was a big thing when I was a, and I was a student, you know, what did you do during, during the summer? Oh, I took your rail through Europe. That was the best, you know, like exploring the world and seeing that. Um, you're right. 
we're in a, we're, we're on the own those little habit trail wheels and um, to be able to get off and, and see the, see the planet. Um, one of the best stories that I teach my students early in the semester. Um, so I teach in a big auditorium and I might have 120 students. And I, I say, how many of you want to be well, you know, wealthy and, you know, all of the hands go up and then we start talking, breaking down what, what it is that they want to do with that. And I have some, some class projects that teach about profit, you know, creating, you know, crazy profits and then having a purpose to that. So profit with a purpose about going back to this wealthy conversation. A lot of times people don't know why they want to be wealthy. Like why, why do you want a lot of money and it goes to those those values and those sort of life lessons and if you don't have the there are countless stories that are told you know the biblical stories from you know thousands of years ago to you know um king solomon the, known as the wisest man on the planet you know had it all but wasn't you know couldn't find happiness and um it wasn't just money and power and uh you know wine song all of that um fame, all of that, it was, there was more to it than, than that. So, you know, what is it that you're going to do with your, with your wealth? Um, I think being able to find that and the answers to those sort of philosophical questions are best found through, through travel. So um, I'm hoping that my daughter will go and explore and, and learn some of those lessons on her own. Cause as a dad, there's only so much you can teach your children. Um, but that's a very important lesson that I taught my students as told through the context of uh, in Petra, Jordan, these amazing ruins, uh, and you, I'm sitting on the king's, uh, uh, you know, the floor where the king used to live, and no one even knows his name. Three thousand years ago, is the most powerful man on the planet, but no one even knows his name anymore. Um, so, um, be careful about wanting wealth for the sake of just wealth. So many lessons like that. Absolutely. You. So I was reading on the did a little bit of research in the newspapers and then in one article, it stated that when you married your wife, there was an agreement that if there was an opportunity to go to space, like she would have to accept and, and, and allow you to go to space. So you've been like, you've been dreaming of this day or this time for a long time, even before like a time where like we were not even close, how how far back space goes for you? Yeah, so let me take you let me take you back from launch to to the beginning just quickly. Um, when I was a kid, I saw an Apollo launch. Um, it was the Apollo eleven launch off the coast of Florida. My parents, as I mentioned, you know, we were travelers. We would go from Florida to Washington State, and that. Um, in that wood paneled station wagon. And we stopped off um, and watched that launch in Cape Canaveral. And it just shook the earth and it literally lit up the sky. And I was like, I want to be an astronaut. So my, my fourth grade teacher was Mrs. Glenn, a uh, familiar name. And so the word, you know, the rumor around the school was that was Mrs. Glenn's sister, John Glenn's sister. So we always, you know, we were close to the space program and, um, Went to college, started that travel business. Um, but the first part of that travel business was a marketing company, and I used to, um, I used to promote back. This is 1985. This thing called Project Space Voyage. Uh, There's a brilliant entrepreneur back in. Um, I get it closer so people can see it. Um, there was this brilliant entrepreneur named T.C. Schwartz. This is 1985. He was selling these, promoting these low Earth orbit space trips. A lot like that um, Inspiration4 launch, and we go around the Earth, and then you come back. And I was like, I just want to promote, you know, like I just wanted to sell enough. The goal was to sell enough of those to be able to go myself one day. Um, Challenger happened a year later, and so the whole notion of human space travel um, outside of NASA was a no go. Um, fast forward, so it was that was 1985, 1986, and then. 10 years later, I got, I got engaged. Um, and we were planning our wedding in 1997. I, I said to my wife, Hey, if I ever get a chance to go to, to space, I just want to let you know ahead of time. I want to, I want to be able to do that. And she was like, it was not a written thing, but you know, 
she's like, whatever, you know, as if that's ever going to happen. Um, and so 25 years, you know, later after traveling the world, um, I got a call from Blue Origin and said, Hey, do you want to go? And I'm like, yeah. And that we were, you know, we were all at that, that launch and there were people, you know, my, like my friends were ridiculed me mercilessly asking me, you know, uh, Jim, how many trips did you sell? Ha ha ha. Yeah. You know? Um, and my wife was like, yeah, like that's ever going to happen. And so 25 years later, there we are at this launch and it's, you know, it's actually happening. And so it was, it was surreal that it actually, you know, came this, this dream came true. Um, you know, wanted, you know, wanted to be an astronaut as a kid sitting in my mom's lap, watching that, that launch take off, you know, paying homage to that little boy that, you know, was dreaming of that 50 years ago and to those professional astronauts that actually made this whole space program um, viable um, to the, you know, that kid that still believed and when he was in college that he was going to sell space travel and one day go to space. And then to that person that kept the dream alive by asking his wife, you know, then, then girlfriend slash fiance, like, you know, Hey, can I go keeping that dream alive? And then, you know, 25 years after that. So 50 years in total, um, hoping that it would one day come true. And then that happened, you know, just recently. You, so you went up and you describe the, the blackness that you experience as eternal black. And I'm reminded of the three words that you, that you expressed at the beginning. One of them is void. Now, in all my years of, of coaching and telling about going and experiencing nature, there's a physicality to life that it's really hard to, to share unless you experience it. Like being under the night sky associated with stars. I mean, you can be in the planetarium with the best star show, but it will never replace that physical experience. Now you went up and I guess like it's hard for you to express what that black is other than saying, you know, it's a void, it's eternal black. But can you, can you try to, to express that physical, that physical experience that you had when you went up and you see, I mean, William Shatner, you know, had the death and life and blue and black, but for you, like how physical was it? So let me answer that in multiple parts. So I'll, I'll take you through this, this, um, and it's, it's only been, you know, a few weeks, so it's still very, believe it or not, I mean, it's still very emotional, like, um, because it was physical, it was, it was, so I've done two zero gravity flights, and I did centrifugal force training at, at NASTAR, and I was not prepared for, um, I, I just was like, oh, I'm an ultra marathon runner, like, my physical tolerance I've got this, like I'm in good shape, done all those other things that I just mentioned, like I'm good. Like I am really good. Like I'm at the top level of people that are ready for this launch emotionally and physically. And I wasn't. Um, and, and so physically it was way more intense than I thought. Um, not like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. I wasn't afraid of dying or be, you know, sitting on top of a hydrogen bomb. It was just like, wow, the G-forces, you know, you can go play the masters in a simulated golf game, but it doesn't recreate, you know, it doesn't mean that if you're teeing off in front of 50,000 people that, you know, that simulation counts for anything. These are real G-forces. And so I'm in seat three, this thing takes off, my heart is pumping and we're laying essentially flat. And so there's supposed to be straight GX, which is G-forces, directly on you and it takes off and after the first you know seven eight hundred miles an hour it's like being an electric car and just going zero to 100 and your face is like wow that's fast and then 200 yeah like 100 200 200 to 400 you know 400 to 800 it's like wow those linear g's just like that i think i got a little gz too because which is up and down g's because not only did we we spun uh but then the the, we tilted a little bit too. So I kind of had this feeling like I'm going up this way underneath, you know, kind of like looking, looking this way. Um, and so it was physically intense. I, we got to 1200 miles an hour and I remember looking up um, and I just saw it on the video we got Friday for the, of the full launch. 
and I was like, somebody said, wow, I could really feel the cheese. And I touched my face because I was like, is my face still there? Like, is my, are my cheeks still attached? It was a lot. So you can do three G's in a simulator. And it's like no big deal. But three G's really going, you know, 1200, 1500, up to 2300 miles an hour is a lot. So then you go through the atmosphere and then it thins out. And it's like, you know, I, I do it best with the sound. It's like, you know, like, like there is zero friction and you can feel the zero friction going up and, and you're, you can see the, the MPH just going faster, 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 and you're just flying. So you hit 2,300 miles an hour and then they call Miko main, main engine cutoff. The capsule separates and then you're up, you look out this window. So here's my window. Uh, it's probably a four foot window and I, I see, so there's six windows across. We, um, after Miko, you can kind of cheat and get your, uh, you, you, no separations coming. You're hoping, you're hoping separations coming. Um, and then you unbuckle your seatbelt and you have roughly three to four minutes. And I remember we got up, we were, uh, we were planning to take a, a picture. So you get up and I remember just being dumbfounded across. So here's my window across. He, uh, there was this, this window and you could see the blackness and I was captivated. Yes, you could see the earth below, but I was captivated by that, that darkness to your question. Um, and then I looked at it, took the picture and came back and looked at it. I was like, there's the earth, but look at that. It's, it's literally, and I said, I said out loud, look at the black. That is the blackest black I have ever seen and, and will ever see. Because the, the, I chose the word void because it is um, in context to that, the, the curved earth below, which was blue. And then the, you can see the little wisp of the atmosphere. That, that context, the, the two of them sort of side by side um, made the black even that much, you know, that much more or that much less like of a color. Um, so the contrast between the two was so extraordinary. Um, and, and seeing that whole uh, thing was like, um, I had no context. Like if I said to somebody, Hey, there's a giraffe. I'm like, Oh, um, I've never seen a giraffe. Um, yeah. Well, it's kind of like a dog with a long neck with a bigger snout. You can kind of take an analog and go, oh, yeah, um, I, I see that. I had no analog for, for seeing. I've seen space movies and stuff like that. But my brain has physically like, never seen anything that resembles like, uh, like that version of a giraffe. And, and then to see it from upside down was even more you know, mind boggling, mind numbing. Um, so, yeah, the, I think eternal is just it's, it's infinite, right? It's it's there could be no other um, than, you know, that a void of something creates an infinite of something else. And that's what, that's what that was. And I think that's why I use those, those words. I was talking to a uh, sign Proctor and she was telling about the earth, like how, what she didn't expect was the brightness and the warmth of the light coming from the earth. And, obviously the context of seeing the planet. And this is what Frank White, you know, did with his book, The Overview Effect, coined that, that, that language and where people could express the cognitive shift that they were experiencing because, you know, there was, we hadn't, there was no word, no language to, to try to formulate what people was, were going through. I mean, it's like having this door opening and just seeing this, planet that you came from, all our stories, all our, our history, the, 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 all our conflict, our solutions all come from this little place. And now you're stepping away from it and you're seeing it in context of this vastness of this void, really kind of like the physicality of it. And you're still, and I was talking to Brit, who, you know, from Blue Origin, um, and we we're talking about the, 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 the necessity to, to support the people who go to space so that when they come down, 
they have a, a way to to structure all these emotions that they've experienced because it's overwhelming and you're still processing all this emotion, correct? Oh yeah, it's, there's never there's never a day. Um, I, I will find. I, I will say that. So, so I mentioned physically that it was physically demanding. Uh, that shouldn't put people off, right? Because you know William Shatner was ninety; he did it. I'm just speaking to my own. Like I was overly brazen. Like oh, I got this. Um, but not to minimize, because I thought I think if had I been a little bit more respectful of what 2,300 miles an hour felt like, I would have um, been better at that. But emotionally, I googled like what are the steps of space travel? Like what, are there emotional steps of space travel? And I came up with you know the seven steps of uh, you know of, of space travel. I won't bore those with you now, but but those are all experiences that I'm sure. Uh, Scion and other people have have, have experienced, um, you know, ranging from excitement to denial to uh, I, I was in a, a, a very reflective state saying, I love you to everyone just prior to going, uh, you know, and, and ending with, you know, gratitude and uh, of the, you know, the overview of certainly a, a big part of that um, overview effect. Um, so, it was, um, yeah, I, I think you've got to get physically ready, but also emotionally ready for, for that. And yeah, I'm still glowing and I don't think it's ever going to leave me. I, I, I really don't. I, I don't think I'm ever going to get over it. And I feel, you know, the first 250 people that were like, hey, tell us about it. You know, how was it? Everyone asked the same thing. How was it? And, you know, after the first 250 people, I was like, gosh, I'm saying that kind of the same thing. Um, and I'm kind of tired of doing that. And then and then like an hour later, I was like, um, you just got to go to space. No one has ever been to space. Uh, there's been 108 billion people and 600 have been to space. Hey, man, um, the, how humbling was was that? Right. Um, and so now I feel like it's my responsibility. Everyone that asks to paint the picture, to describe what I just explained to you, um, you know, it doesn't need to be. 20 minutes, but it can be two minutes of painting the picture because I, I'm just one of those people that now somebody knows, um, just a normal guy like me got to go to go to space and they want to know how it was. So I feel that I feel, you know, it's incumbent on me to be able to share that. Um, that's why I love teachings because I can do it on a much, you know, broader and deeper basis. But I, I feel like um, it's my responsibility to share calmly and um, but also emotionally about how amazing it was. So I guess UNC now has the first bragging right of having a teacher that went to space and your classes, uh, I hope they appreciate the, uh, the, how grateful they, they are to have now a teacher who went up to space and it was an even, ever, even better teacher because of going to space. Let me stop. UNC was where <laughs> all of the, um, all, UNC has a, a long history of space. So I'm not the first. There are so many people um, that are way more important in the space uh, in, in space history than me, like Webb, James Webb, like the Webb telescope. He was, you know, he was an alum. Um, I'm sure the Hagels are going to bra brag on uh, Purdue and all, you know, all of their uh, distinguished alum. But UNC um, actually hosted all of the Apollo astronauts and then and then more to learn uh, from, to learn about all of the constellations when they actually went to space. So all of them have been here at Moorhead Planetarium to learn how to, to cite the constellations in case everything went, you know, terribly wrong, um, that they could get back into, uh, you know, successfully re-entry based on their location from, um, from, from studying where the constellations were outside the window. So, um, we have a long story history and I'm like this very small part of it. Um, but, but yeah, go, go heels on that one. <laughs> well, you're definitely among a great team. Um, Jim, before we, we go, I know your, your book is not out yet, but is it going to come out soon? Uh, when it does, where can they learn or can they subscribe to, uh, to a newsletter or do you have a website? So that they can they can uh, be let known that your book is going to come out. My my best thing um, is to follow me on Instagram at Jim Kitchen. Jim 
and then dot period, um, Jim dot kitchen, K I T C H E N. And I am always telling a story of uh, somewhere I've gone or, you know, somewhere I'm going. Um, and I'll definitely be promoting the book uh, through, through there um, and giving some presentations. So if people are interested, um, they can reach out to me at Jim at Jim kitchen.org, Jim at Jim kitchen.org. And i um, happy to speak to groups um, doing some speaking comp um, keynote speeches and, and things like that right now about lessons learned while traveling and going to space, you know, pushing through barriers and boundaries and uh, building high functioning teams and all of those lessons that I teach in my course at UNC, but to a slightly different audience, um, to more of an adult audience, um, but in a fun and engaging way that um, are, are the stories that people need to hear to just live better and deeper uh, lives and more meaningful lives, um, whether it be, you know, t tied you know, together through the, the context of entrepreneurship uh, for a business conference or for, for anyone that just wants to get, um, you know, in this, in this book, I, I sort of wrap it up at the end. I won't tell the, the, the secrets, but it, for me, it's the context of uh, kind of the secret of what life is um, and what's important and, and those things and trying to embody those, those things. And we are, we're all capable of that. So um, thanks, for, thanks for having me. I love what you're doing and, and uh, thanks for having me be a part of it. Well, Jim, I'm looking forward to Swab Books. I'll send you mine. You send me yours. And hopefully uh, you will get, you'll have the opportunity to do the 195th country when the moon opens up and uh, you can find your way over there. Jim, it was a pleasure. We'll put oh. all the links in the, um, in the description for you, uh, for people to reach out to you and to connect with you and to follow you. But thank you so much for your time. Thanks. I appreciate you.